All right, well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everyone to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very glad to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host. I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour. And we're going to be diving into a fantastically important topic today with a terrific guest. Now what I'd like to do is introduce this week's topic and this week's guest. We're looking at open access in scholarly publication. It's kind of the nerdier sibling to open education resources. It refers to giving open access to the scholarly output of higher education, such as monographs and in particular scholarly journal articles. And this is a field that's been truckling along for, well, I would estimate 20 years now. And the amount of content and the number of projects in open access has been growing. The ecosystem is beginning very complex and the issues are very dynamic and changing rapidly. There's a lot going on. I can think of no better guide to that field than my friend Glenn Hampson. Glenn is the founder and organizer of both the Science Communication Institute and the Open Scholarship Initiative. Now, OSI is an unusual creature because what it does is it brings together open access advocates of all kinds from around the world and it also brings together proprietary publishers from around the world. To put them together at the same table is pretty unusual and the conversations are fascinating. Uh, it's really important work. I'm really glad that we can have uh, its uh, chief organizer here with us. And without any further ado, let me bring Glenn up on stage. Hello, sir. Brian, good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, can you just quickly tell everybody where you're coming from today? Coming from uh, a dark, apparently, uh, back bedroom in my house in Seattle. So it's uh, one of the you know, only areas of the country that aren't hit by tornadoes or floods or fires right now. So happy to be here. <laughs> oh, please enjoy, enjoy while you can. Okay, right, right, right. And, and of course it's dark because it's Seattle, we understand. <laughs> Glenn, we, we have a, a habit here on, on the forum when we ask people to introduce themselves, we do it in a specific way. We ask you what you're gonna be working on for the next year. <laughs> what are the big projects? What are the big ideas that are top of mind and likely take up most of your schedule? You mean other than the shed that I'm building in my backyard? Let's not talk about that yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, so OSI has been, uh, as you know, you've been you've been there since the very beginning, Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been going on strong since uh, late 2014, um, and we divided our work into into three main parts. The first part was just to figure out where we are, to get our footings, to to do the the research and and figure out what the landscape looks like. Uh, the second part, uh, which was from 2019 to last year, was to sort of lay the groundwork for our policy direction. Uh, what what exactly, knowing what we know, what exactly what we would we try to accomplish. And then this final stage that we've embarked on is to put the rubber to the road and, and, and try to create that policy. So that's, that's where we're at now. We're working with UNESCO uh, on trying to uh, create something out of all of this work that, you've, uh, that you and the other OSIers have done and, uh, and, and see where it takes us. So over the next couple of years, uh, uh, we'll engage with UNESCO and with other partners in the space to, to try to do exactly that. So, well, excellent. A big dive into the policy world. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving us that. Um, the uh, friends, the way the forum works is this is driven by your questions, your comments, and your thoughts. And so, uh, I'm going to ask Glenn a really quick question right now, just to kick things off a bit. Then it's all up to you. So again, just you know, to raise, click that raised hand button if you want to join us on stage. Uh, especially if, like I, like myself, you think that uh, Glenn bears a terrifying resemblance to George Clooney, <laughs> and you just want to be there. Um, or again, to click the question mark button and to type in your questions and, and thoughts. My, my just first quick question I wanted to ask you, Glenn, um, is, and I know it's early for this, but what do you see as the impact of COVID and the pandemic on open access? Did that encourage more publishers to produce more open stuff? Did that, did that give open content a, a greater audience already, or is it too soon to tell? 
I, I want to let your audience know uh, that Brian didn't brief me on any of these questions ahead of time. So <laughs> thank you for uh, that's a lot of question. You said it was going to be a simple one anyway. So it is a simple one. It's not, not it anything. Simple one. It, it's, it's one of those, uh, is it where you stand depends on where you sit or the other way around? Or it's, it's, uh, I, I think it's generated a lot of interest in the potential of open. Uh, the reality has been somewhat less than uh, stellar, I think. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the hope, of course, is that open that making things open uh, will uh, enable greater uh, collaboration between researchers, not only in COVID, but climate change and, and, and vaccines and uh, of all kinds and, and, and whatever. Um, but what happens in, in reality is that there are, you know, science has, and the very premise of science is founded on collaboration and cooperation. You can't have science without. Them. So what we saw during the pandemic was, uh, uh, sort of a mini flood of uh, uh, what are called preprints, uh, not journal articles, but articles that went into non-peer-reviewed uh, locations. Uh, we saw uh, a mini flood of, uh, of researchers who were collaborating at the margins to share genetic code data and so forth to try to accelerate research. Uh, what we didn't see was a, a, a giant, you know, breaking of the of the paywalls. <clears throat> Uh, where where uh, researchers from pharma companies shared their IP openly and freely with the rest of the world uh, yeah. in a kumbaya yeah. moment to let's all work on this together. So yeah. um, I, I think a lot has a lot has been made of the fact that there was uh, a lot of interest uh, and a lot of uh, sharing via preprints, uh, but uh, as the uh, WHO chief said, it also created a bit of an infodemic uh, mm -hmm. where we have a lot of bad information coming out there, a lot of unvetted information uh, where the press was picking up on a lot of this research that uh, whether it was in the, you know, hydro hydroxychloroquine or whatever that, that really didn't deserve to get that kind of attention. So uh, <clears throat> we're, we're still trying to figure it out is the short answer to your question, Brian. Uh, hopefully we can figure out what worked and what didn't and, uh, and, and what we can build on and what we can hopefully not build on. No, that's a really good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you know, when I was asking people to ask questions, like trying to encourage it, four questions just popped up. Oh, sorry. Hey, let me bring these on stage because you folks are awesome. Uh, so to begin with, let me get uh, Alex. Uh, let's see. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, this is, uh, uh, click the right button for this. Hang on one second, friends. My browser just had a hiccup. There we go. Uh, this is from Alex and Curly, who asks, how might we leverage open access to support open education? Good question. It, it's a huge question. I, I, you know, so I, I wish I had a graphic. I should have brought a poster with me, Brian, that, that describes uh, open access. Uh, really fundamentally, um, there, there is no um, description, an accurate, uh, one size fits all description for, for what open access is. So let me start my answer with that. Um, for some people, it just means um, the ability to, to read for free uh, an article. Uh, for others, it means that that article has to be uh, properly licensed. So it can be shared, reused, redistributed at will. Uh, for others, still, it means those conditions plus uh, uh, this material has to be immediately available. So it can't be embargoed for a year or whatever until the author is willing to let it go. So uh, depending on how you define open access, uh, in, in OSI, uh, uh, the participants that came up with a very clever uh, description of it, 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 open really has five main traits and, and they call them darts, how discoverable it is, how mm. accessible it is, how reusable, transparent and sustainable it is. So along those five dimensions, you see a wide variety of different open outcomes. You see, uh, you, you may be familiar with the different color coding and, and open, there's gold and green and bronze and uh, hybrids and all kinds of different, uh, very confusing <laughs> descriptions of what various kinds of open are, but those all fall along this DART spectrum. So, 
so the question to, to your question, how can we use open access to further open education? Really, uh, there's many different ways of making information open. It doesn't all have to be the same kind of open, and, and it's just uh, any and all efforts uh, are, are welcome to, to uh, whether it's you're changing the licensing, whether you're making things more discoverable, whether you're just manually making things, uh, you know, connecting the dots and, and bringing researchers together to share information, uh, whether you're creating networks of uh, researchers who can share uh, proprietary data, not with the public, but just with each other. There's a thousand different ways to do this, but open is at the center of the conversation, really. Um, and again, I wish I had graphics behind me to, <laughs> to go into some of this in more detail, but uh, to answer your question, uh, how can we use it? We can use it in a thousand different ways and, and, and we should use it. I, 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 the devil is in the details there. I wish I could describe it more clearly. And we're going to bring up some devils, I think, in a, in a little uh, while. Thank you. That's, okay. a, that's a terrific answer. And Alexandra, that was a, a, a great question. Uh, I, in the chat um, and also on the screen, I threw out a link to uh, Glenn's really excellent slideshow introducing the state of play and uh, open access. Uh, I think you guys have seen that before, but that's, that gives you a lot and some great graphics for there. Um, but that's, that's a great example. And friends, if you're new to the forum, that's how easy it is to get a question um, on the screen. Uh, now, speaking of uh, on the screen, let me show you a video question. Uh, this is our longtime friend uh, from the uh, Houston area, Tom Hames, uh, and he wanted to ask a question about open systems of knowledge. And let me let him put it to you because he's uh, better at asking this than I am. Hello, Tom. Hi. Let I don't. I don't know if uh, if I uh, if I I'm better at asking things than you are, but we'll we'll see. Um, so my question is what kind of systemic barriers do you see as the primary uh, limiter on open systems of knowledge? I mean, the you know, I put in the chat sort of tongue in cheek is legitimacy based on scarcity uh, as well. And that's, you know, all of those things feeding together. It's, it, it is, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been frustrated doing research uh, only to run into a roadblock of a paywall that my institution doesn't want to pay for. Right. And so, you know, and, and, and that's, completely antithetical to my goal of finding out the information and synthesizing it with other information, which I'm sure you've heard a hundred times. So I was just wondering though, uh, you know, what do you see as the primary systemic challenges? Why do people still feel like they have to lock things down in the first place? Uh, Brian, these are, I, thank you for inviting me to this forum. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 says quite, he says very regretfully. No, no. You see, what, what, what has been so wonderful about OSI is that we get questions like this occasionally, and it just sends me back to my rabbit hole for a month just researching, like, what the heck? I don't know. And, and you know, there's a lot of research behind finding out a proper answer to those sorts of questions. But so in, in my experience, anyway, uh, reading and, and listening to the OSI folks, uh, and, and looking at the surveys that have been done in this field and so forth, mm -hmm. um, probably the primary barrier to adoption is in, in the research field anyway, it, are, are the researchers themselves. Um, mm -hmm. There is a tremendous reluctance on the part of researchers um, to participate for, for an, a, a number of reasons. One is it's not altogether clear all the time what it is they need to do to participate. Uh, publishing a paper in open access can involve, you know, speaking to your library and then, and then, you know, signing away certain things and, and, and it's, it's, it's not a push button uh, enterprise for, for most researchers. Uh, another important uh, factor in all this uh, is, is that the researchers are concerned about misuse of their information, uh, whether that's um, having their discoveries scooped uh, because they published openly and then somebody else came along and, and discovered something with their data before they were ready to, to, to uh, let go of it, uh, or because they uh, just don't altogether trust the, you know, what's going to happen to their information in the wild. Not necessarily scooped, but, but misused, misinterpreted, and so forth. In survey after survey, and Taylor and Francis has done several of these over the years, uh, and, and a number of other surveys have, have, have taken place. Uh, researchers 
first and foremost want their research to make a difference. They want it to have an mm -hmm. impact. Uh, they want it to be read by the right people. Uh, they want it to have an impact on their career. Um, they, and, and, and what kind of, what career stage they're at will, will oftentimes drive what choices, the publishing choices they'll make. So early career researchers will opt for the, uh, trying to go for the high impact journals and then later stage researchers will be a little bit more flexible about where to publish and so forth. So uh, it's, it, it, it's really researcher, uh, centric and there, that's one of the reasons that OSI has sort of come to the conclusion that um, any solutions to the future of open and, and trying to wring out the uh, all, all the benefits that open has to, to offer need to be researcher centric. We need to work first with the researchers, figure out what researchers want and need, what their concerns are, what their perspectives are uh, and, and build systems that, that, uh, accommodate those, and, and and they vary from one field to another. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Physics and astronomy have been wide open for long before you know, open access came along. Uh, chemistry has been very locked down, uh, conversely, uh, funded largely by industry. So, um, so there there are other tangents to that, but I think that the the locus that you're looking for is we need to get researchers on board. We need to find out how to work with them more effectively. And, and from there, uh, you know, build solutions that work for them. And I think, this is what I've written into the, the most recent papers, I, I, I think that, that once researchers themselves are convinced and they see mm -hmm. the benefits of being open, then, it, then you don't have to have a marketing campaign behind it. Then it's, right. then it's, then it's obvious, then, then you're doing is, it out of self-interest, right? Is open access still seen as somehow less legitimate yes. than closed? It is, yeah, and and it, it, again, it varies from field to field. It varies from re, uh, career stage. Uh, younger researchers tend less think to tend tend to think less that way than the older researchers. Um, researchers in some institutions think don't think that way necessarily. Um, uh, institutions like Harvard that have been uh, in the center of open access for a long time, um, and their institutions have gotten strongly behind it, tend not to feel mm -hmm. as much that way. Uh, but it does very much. Uh, there's there's a, a, a prevalent sense that open is not as prestigious, uh, and and that's another thing that we've been working on in, in OSI is that you can't just attack open as this uh, separate entity. It's it's there's all kinds of tendrils connected to it, like impact mm -hmm. factors and peer review and uh, embargoes and so forth. And you have to look at this big picture. Um, because even if you do say tomorrow that um, you know all researchers are henceforth required to publish in open access, they're all going to try to figure out what the highest impact open access journal is. Because impact is what's mm -hmm. driving um, you know their, sure. their, their their tenure considerations and so forth. So, so we need we need to look at that big picture. Um, but yeah, right. Reach is impact too, though. But I'll Reach, leave it there. Reach yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, but but again, we need more data on that because even mm -hmm. though even though open access theoretically gets you more reach, uh, you're getting more readership with the subscription journals that uh, that are high impact. So um, it, it's we, we need we need some. Uh, and again, that goes back to the, the need for more data on this to, to figure out exactly what researchers want and need and how to how to get there from here. We need more poor scholars who can't afford to pay for the journals. That'll well, solve the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 a there, there's problems every way every way you slice it. No, no easy answers. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah. there is definitely a good question, Tom. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Glenn, this is the Future Transform community. People ask terrific questions. Yeah. And thankfully, we have great guests like you who have terrific answers. Yeah. Yep. Friends, if you, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. You see how easy it is. Um, now let me, uh, so if you'd like to join us on stage, please feel free. But in the meantime, we have more questions coming up. So let me just put one up here. This is from our friend Mathieu Plurl, who says, what will happen to publishers if academics start publishing on their own for real? <laughs> we know parasites need a host to survive after all, smiley face. Um, yeah. You want me to put that back up again or did you get that? No, I got the parasites part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's, you know, it, more power to them. I mean, there's plenty of spinoff publishers, uh, plenty of, you know, small publishers are trying to make a difference like that. And plenty of uh, university presses that are trying to, to, to make a difference like that. The, the reality is publishing is a marketplace. Um, it always has been. And I think the question before us is, will it always be? Uh, and the efforts that the uh, open community are trying to make, uh, some of those efforts are explicitly directed toward taking down the big publishers of the world. You know, Elsevier, who needs them? Um, and others are, uh, again, going back to the, the needs of the researchers, uh, many researchers feel that the publishing big publishers are serving their needs just fine. Thank you. Please don't destroy them. Um, there, there isn't this uniform sense that publishers are are parasites. Um, so, but there is there is a sense in, out there, uh, especially among the activist community, that um, <clears throat> that their profit margins need to be trimmed and so forth. It's a it's a fascinating conversation, but the answer, as with anything in life, <laughs> is more complicated than. Uh, than what you might suspect. It's a, it's a great question, Mathieu, and I appreciate yeah. the pungency of the phrasing. And it, it yeah. is it, it is a, a very deep question. And Glenn, I just want to make sure everyone heard that note that publishing has been a marketplace for like, what, about a century now? Um, well, well, unless you consider, you know, since the Royal Society, basically. No, or, no yeah. that, was, that was kind of like nonprofit circulation you know, but but I'm thinking, from that from that point, little newsletters started to spin off, and and, and so forth. Yeah, it's always been there's always been a middleman between science right. and the public. It has, it has not been uh, an that's enterprise true. generally where the scientists reach directly to the public. Right. So. No, that's true. The middleman is a, is a good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for the question, Mitya. And we have more coming in, a whole flood of these. So let me just give you a chance to take a whack at these. And here's one about UNESCO. Any OSI involvement in the first draft of the UNESCO recommendation on open science? Yes. Yes, we were there. Uh, we consulted on it. We uh, uh, sat on a panel. I sat on a panel uh, for the North America Europe feedback panel or whatever, uh, sounding board panel. Um, uh, and then OSI drafted uh, a, a comment on the first draft which was largely critical, <coughs> critical actually. Um, I, I think um, UNESCO's heart is in the right place on that, but it's, and this is just speaking for me and not for OSI, uh, but it's a bit too idealistic, idealistic um, and it needed to be a bit more realistic, but I wish them well in their endeavors. Um, consideration, um, has been tabled for now. We don't know exactly why. It was going to be presented in November um, to the General Assembly for approval, but uh, we received a note last week that um, that won't be happening right now. No. So I don't know what the politics is there. Uh, we're all sort of uh, curious. Uh, sort of off the record, uh, you know, UNESCO was not a one mind about this. Um, mm. Open science policy was produced by the Natural Sciences Division of UNESCO. Um, the sector that we've been working with since 2014 is the communication and information um, sector. And they are the ones who have been studying open access since the early days and have a wealth of information. But I, I, I'm told that they collaborated on this and so forth. But the reality is that they're, I think they're are different opinions within UNESCO about exactly what open uh, should should look like. So um, we're continuing to work with the CI sector on on what we call the uh, open solutions approach to the future, um, which is more than just open science, but it's an approach that combines uh, open access, open data, open science, open government, OER, open solutions. Uh, the, the idea being that all of these efforts have in common um, uh, similar goals. Uh, their methodology is different, their focus points are different, but the goals are the same. So if we can unite uh, together on, on common goals, uh, then we can, from that, from that effort, um, start developing best practices and, and, and techniques that 
um, that combine all these things and come up with something that's uh, more applicable in real world situations than, than just open access or open data. And the, and the reason I say real world is that, uh, you know, any researcher in a, in a setting doesn't, isn't concerned just about whether their uh, journal article is, is properly licensed. They're also concerned about whether their data is properly formatted and, and available to other researchers, um, whether they're getting the media exposure that they need and so forth, and uh, whether they have any, uh, whether that research can then make a policy impact, uh, whether that research or research can be used in, in educational materials. It's a, it's a, it's a web of uh, technique and understanding. And so we're hoping that we can um, sort of push that vision forward as opposed to just, you know, here's how you do open access, here's how you do open data, here's how you do uh, open science. Open solutions. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you uh, for the question. And uh, I appreciate the breakdown. I don't envy you the uh, elaborate political enterprise you have to do to work with, uh, work with UNESCO. It's a lot of work. Um, we have uh, a question coming in from, uh, and by the way, the chat box is uh, on fire with people offering uh, links and ideas oh, wow. Good. Uh, about academia.edu and a few other things. So those of you in the chat box, if you'd like to uh, uh, lift anything out from there and put it as a question, please, please do join us. We'd be we're glad to. Uh, this is a question about open washing. Uh, Franny uh, Gade, I believe, asks, can you reflect on open washing? I've been reading some discourse about open access being hijacked by scholarly publishing conglomerates. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard that term before. That's interesting. Uh, the open space is, is, how would you describe it, Ryan? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it can be very combative, I guess. Yes. Uh, there's, there's some very hard, hardened opinions on, on both sides or on all sides. Uh, and generally, you know, these communities don't speak with each other, which is one of the reasons why um, we've developed OSI and why I think it's been so valuable. Yeah. Um, there are people who think that publishers don't belong in this conversation. In fact, we've heard from some funders who said, you know, we like what you're doing, but we're not going to give you any money because you have publishers sitting at the table. Um, it's, it's important to listen to everybody and to, to learn from everybody. Uh, as far as publishers hijacking the process, I mean, they're, I, no, I mean, um, ultimately they're the ones publishing the materials. And so the community has asked the publishers to develop solutions. Um, mm. these solutions, uh, I mean, the ideal was at, at one point, well, if we have a bunch of open access publishers come along, then they will supplant Elsevier and Taylor and Francis and so forth because they're doing it for cheaper and they're doing it, you know, more efficiently and everybody wants open access. And so who needs Elsevier at that point? But the reality is it it hasn't worked that way. Not everybody wants open access and, and it takes a lot of money to, to publish stuff. Um, and, <clears throat> and the researchers, as I mentioned, they still want to publish in the highest impact journals. So they're not going to necessarily publish with the, uh, hey, I just started this journal yesterday. Uh, project so, um, so the, the publishers have responded to the uh, the need of the community for open access and their and their request of the community. Um, unfortunately, predictably, I think um, it's they've continued to make money doing so. Uh, we've known for the last five years at least that the cost of APCs, uh, article processing charges, author processing charges, however you define it. Uh, has increased way faster than inflation. Can, can uh, I pause you for a second? Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, not a comment. But uh, so an APC, yeah. uh, an author processing charge. This is yeah. the charge that a an author or authors have to pay in order for uh, their article to be published yeah. through some open frameworks. Yeah, it, it's it's what Plan S is all about, and I, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that too. But uh, generally, <clears throat> you have in the past, you had paywalls, right? Subscription charges that prevented yeah. the world from accessing materials. Uh, and then along came um, 
efforts like uh, OA 2020, the, the Global Flip Plan, um, and, and, and others, uh, which said, you know what, why don't we transform these subscription journals into a format where the authors pay to publish in them, and then the outputs can be free and, and open to the rest of the world, which sounded great. And people did the math, and they said, there's enough money in the world for that to happen, so let's do it. Um, not very many journals flipped. Um, not very many people, again, were interested in that, but it pushed forward anyway. And then Plan S came along with, uh, uh, I think, 13, well, at least 11 national funders in Europe and then, and then the Gates Foundation, welcome, um, and started to mandate that and said that by roughly by now um, that journals would need to be open uh, or else they wouldn't be, uh, the researchers wouldn't be funded. So it's, it's sort of the, the, the mandate to end all mandates. And, um, and, and publishers started responding to that by, um, transforming journals coming into these transformative agreements, which is again, is another aside there. But um, so uh, I'm, I've lost track of the, <laughs> the original. <laughs> we, we, um, where were we, Brian, originally? The original uh, question was about open washing. So so the publishers then have, have responded to this by, by transforming to APCs. Um, but because these APCs have increased faster than the rate of inflation, um, they're astronomical now. Uh, you may have heard, you know, the cost to, to publish an article in Nature now is somewhere around thirteen thousand dollars or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it used to be just a couple of years ago the average APC charge was about twenty five hundred dollars, and that would be for PLOS. And, mm -hmm. and there were other journals that could offer an APC charge of two hundred dollars. The lower end journals. Mm -hmm. um, but now if, if APCs start to become the de facto way of publishing, um, and we also know from other research that researchers aren't priced, they're not connected to this price. They're not generally not paying it out of their research budgets. The libraries are paying it or their, their grant, grant agencies are paying it. So there's, there's no cost controls. They're not, shop, they're not comparison shopping for the best price. So th these APC prices have started to go up and the publishers have said, well, you know, that worked out well. Um, we're providing APCs and open access, and we're making more money than we were before, which wasn't the original intent uh, of all this. Mm -hmm. So our publishers price washing, yeah, I mean, uh, they're, they're making money from it, but it's what the open community wanted. Uh, the outcome is different than they expected. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, thank you for, for wending your way through uh, the elements Sorry. of that, Glenn. Uh, no, don't apologize. I meant very sincerely. Uh, Franny uh, Gaidi, thank you again for your really, really good question. Uh, and you can see that we have uh, uh, even more people who are interested in this in different ways. There's some back and forth about uh, about uh, what this means in the chat and some more questions coming up. Uh, and we, we don't have enough acronyms, so I want to bring in one more. Uh, and this is from the excellent, excellent uh, Janet Zlotnick, uh, who asks, what is the impact, if any, of institutions signing into DORA or similar declarations that challenge how research is evaluated? So I think I think you'd probably have to tell people what Dora is just to get us going. Yeah, the Declaration of Research Assessment. Declaration of Dora. It's a San Francisco Declaration of Research. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the A part. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it. But the intent, the intent there of, of Dora, and there are other similar. Um, uh, there's the Leiden Manifesto, and there's some other things that, that that people have signed. It's it's a it's a statement of. Uh, of belief in in a in, in research transparency, uh, making data open, making data you know interoperable and transparent and and accessible, and and it's there is no impact. It's it's um, other than raising awareness of the need to do this and creating a sort of a sense of solidarity that there's communities that support this uh, and. Uh, but but there aren't any teeth to Dora. It's not like uh, I, I do actually believe that. Uh, I mean, a number of funding agencies have subscribed to this, obviously. The, but 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 there's no <clears throat> there's no checklist after that that says uh, you know do you comply with Dora and it's eleven whatever you know. Uh, so uh, other similar acronyms. There's Fair, um, which I think probably has received a little bit more traction and. An emphasis, especially in the data community, that's um, go, gofair.com. It's the making data 
findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, has that had any impact? Again, no, but it, it has raised awareness. It's, it's, it's an important mechanism for the community to be able to, to, to sort of say that we're behind this, but it doesn't actually result in things being more open or more transparent. Uh, that, that, that comes from within science itself. Yeah. And researchers. And researchers, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, I just found the, the people have been uh, throwing things in the, in the chat, including links, but you, you're, uh, you're, you gave us a really, really solid answer to that great question. Janet, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have more work to do, it sounds like. Uh, we had a question from uh, uh, that came in from uh, the library community from someone who can't make it here today. Oh. Um, and they wanted to ask a simple provocative question. Isn't green open access good enough? So I, I want to run that past you. You may, you may have to tell people hey, green, green OA is when, is when institutions or individuals self-host or self-archive the content uh, rather than going through an intermediary. Well, why isn't that enough, or is it? Uh, you need like a twelve-hour program to go through some of this stuff. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's deep. So, it's so deep. green green is what the U.S. uses. It's the uh, the U.S. has a a public access program, uh, which was negotiated by uh, a couple of OSIRs, um, and, and just back in two thousand eight, I think, wow. uh, between publishers and and NIH and so on. Um, but green is is yeah it's it it could be archiving in an institutional repository, it could be archiving in PubMed Central, it could be putting it on you know your own blog, it could be it, it, it basically it's it's yeah it's just it's just out there, and it could be copyrighted, it could be CCBY, it could be whatever. It's just the, the common denominator is it's just accessible, it's free to read. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, but it can be embargoed. It, can, it covers all kinds of stuff. So most open, and I said early on that there is no single definition for open. Most open is green. Um, only somewhere 25%, actually less than that, probably 13%. Um, I could put a link to send a link to you, Brian, for some actual figures on this, but, uh, Less of it is gold. Um, there's more hybrid than gold, um, but it goes kind of green, hybrid, gold. And gold is the what you hear from Plan S. That's the, the gold standard of, of open. Oh, or actually, okay. platinum is the gold standard. But um, gold gold is gold is where it's immediate. It's CCBY licensed, um, and it's archived in a in a proper location that's sustainable and and so on. Diamond is where the author doesn't have to pay anything for it, uh, but the the, uh, the funder is paying for it. So it's um, so is green good enough? I, I mean, no. I mean, it's not good enough for some people. It's good enough for it's been good enough for PubMed Central, but it's not where a lot of people want the future to go. Right. Um, the the point is that open exists on a spectrum, and there are many different kinds of outcomes. And I think uh, in OSI we've sort of believed that we need to embrace that spectrum, uh, support all different uh, efforts uh, toward open and not just say that it, it has to be this or, or it doesn't count um, because there's different needs and, and <clears throat> different perspectives on it and so forth. So, um, so anyway, short answer is green good enough? Um, depends, probably not. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, in, in the chat, uh, Ryan, who I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring another one of his questions up, he observes, the problem with green is that you cannot often find it if it's not discoverable. Uh, so well, that's, that's yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, it's not necessarily. It's it's um, the problem with green is that it doesn't have a set definition. We don't know what green is. I mean, it's it's really everything is green um, if it's readable uh, for free. Um, and so, but we do, but we do need to have better better indexing of, of information. And, um, and Brian, as you know, one of my I have to throw this in before time runs out, but one of the Please. things I pushed for for a long time has been sort of an all scholarship uh, repository, uh, a central location where we can warehouse all information, uh, and and then from there, uh, sort of uh, 
create a global effort to to coalesce data that makes you know that, that fits together um, to create new standards for data deposits um, uh, from from there to allow everybody to access this central repository so it's findable it's it's usable uh, in a usable format it's got the proper uh, you know provenance and it uh, and it's sustainable uh, and and journals can journal all journals become overlay journals where they go in and they and they see what's getting read the most and what's what's getting the most traction and from there they publish that information or they fine tune it or uh, and, and so on but um, yeah. well, I've read that in science fiction before yes it is <laughs> It's still, it's still sad. But for now, we have, we actually have, we have different, many different silos, right? We have the, uh, yeah. the European Science Cloud. We have different, different clouds that don't speak to each other except through metadata. Um, so that's not working either. Well, Lim, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's that's a good direction to take this in. Ryan uh, has a, a question that he asked. I want to bring this up, which is, could you speak to the models of OA, including read and publish, for example, and the viability of APCs for authors? In particular, those in early career or less well-funded institutions. I think you started talking about this a bit, um, but if you can build on that a little. Yeah. So, read and publish agreements. There, there, there's actually different. They're part of the transformative agreement universe um, that some universities uh, are now engaging in. The University of California recently entered into a transformative agreement with Elsevier. Um, they're also known as publish and read agreements. They're, Kind of the same thing, but not really. Uh, mm. And there's offsetting agreements, but all of these agreements, um, the general focus is to try to make journals more affordable to universities, and to try to increase the amount of open uh, access publishing that that authors at those universities are allowed to to do. So, um, in a in the University of California's recent agreement with Elsevier, for example. Um, <clears throat> that it, it, instead of the university paying each time a, an author wants to publish in an Elsevier journal, they get you know a set a set they pay a set fee, and then they get access to the universe of Elsevier journals, except for I think the Cell, Cell and the Lancet. But uh, <clears throat> uh, they get they get one price access to all Elsevier journals, and in return they get to publish for free in those journals, uh, and those journals get. Uh, published in open access format. So there's, there's offsetting costs. It gives universities some more predictability with regard to their budgets. So they're not worried about, you know, a constant yeah. increase of it that led to a cereals crisis of not so long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it also pushes forward the ability of those universities to publish more, more open and in theory be able to share their research more, more easily with the rest of the world. Downsides, uh, not all universities are in a position to do that. If you're the University of California system, that's great. You have market power. Uh, Elsevier is not likely to show up to Wenatchee Valley College and uh, do the same sort of uh, agreement with them. So there is a fear that there's some cost shifting that's going to occur um, in this setup where publishers are losing money with, or they're not making as much money with the University of California system. So guess who's gonna pay um, those additional costs? Uh, the universities that are less able to, to pay. Uh, and as far as um, APCs go, uh, there's also an equity, big equity concern there. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for somebody at Harvard um, on a good grant uh, to, to publish in Nature because, you know, their, their school can pay for it or their funders can, can pick, pick up the tab. Um, but <clears throat> generally, you know, scholars in Africa are are just crying bloody murder about this right now. It's uh, the the APC charge is you know, three times their annual salary, and uh, their school their school doesn't doesn't have the the, the resources to cover this. Uh, so, in in the past, we had paywalls uh, that were limiting access, and we were working to get around those. Uh, and now we have what they're calling playwalls, where uh, if you don't have enough money, you can't even publish your science. Uh, and you're forced to turn to uh, <clears throat> fly-by-night journals, uh, you know, yeah. in, in some case, outright predatory journals who, who aren't really journals, but they're they're just, you know, give me your money and we'll put your article up and we'll peer review it. Um, and, and who knows how long that 
will stay online. So it's, uh, there, there's concern amongst uh, many in this in this field that this whole APC direction um, is not the right way to go, uh, and, and that these read and publish, publish and read agreements are uh, helpful in the short term, but in the long term they may be sort of calcifying our reliance on this APC model, which may not, uh, which may make the access situation and the equity situation worse in the developing world <clears throat> and not better. Are we are we likely to see any nationalization of yeah. scholarly publishing? Just, sure. Uh, yeah. Any yeah. I, I, thank you for that question. Yeah, China is going to do exactly that. Uh, uh, China is not enamored with, uh, and China, as you know, is the world's biggest publisher right now uh, of of science journal articles. Uh, they passed the U.S. last year. Uh, they don't think they're being treated fairly by the West, and they're going to start their own series of journals uh, with their uh, a focus on you know impact and and so on. Uh, and they're going to require their their uh, their uh, academics to publish a certain amount in those homegrown journals. Um, so we see that. Um, uh, India ha announced a plan uh, last year, I believe, um, that's not aligned with Europe's plan, mm. but instead mm. they want to have a national subscription plan. Uh, you know, in, in, instead of flipping to APCs and whatever, um, They'll just pay one fee and and you know, get a bundle, a uh, subscription bundle. That's their that's their approach. Um, or that hasn't been finalized yet, but that's what they've been talking about. Uh, in the U.S., there's been rumblings that maybe and I uh, also tired of getting squeezed in this uh, in this vice of uh, publishing versus open access wars. They're just going to start their own uh, brand of journals. So to be determined, um, it's very fascinating, really. Um, the, the question comes down to, uh, and it's a rich question, which, you know, everybody here has a different perspective on, but what is publishing? Uh, mm. What role does it play? And um, mm. every country, every discipline really has its own perspective on that. So, Yeah. Well, I'm going to, because we're almost out of time, I'm, I'm going to take an oh, opportunity okay. to ask a really basic question, um, which is, what are the odds that we see a, a flip to majority of scholarship in open access by, say, 2025? Uh, well, it's already happening. Um, most, uh, over 50% of all journal articles now being published are in an open format. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so that's big. Um, but it again depends on how, to, how you define open. They're not being published in a gold format, which is no embargo, CCB by, by license, and so on. But they're published in, in some sort of an open format, a hybrid format, which is open, but it's sitting on the publisher's website, which means you have to register for whatever. Um, or it's uh, <clears throat> coming off of embargo and it's and it's sitting on the PubMed Central site. So you can get to over 50% of all materials uh, today um, that are newly published. But the historical record is um, around 72% of all materials um, are, are dark still. Um, and the remainder are accessible in some format. So there's a lot of work to be done undarking uh, those, those materials. Uh, but also figuring out a way to do more with with open rather than just seeing open as a goal, as a terminal goal. Let's make something open. Uh, you know, great. Why? What are we going to do with it then? Instead of seeing it as this this goal into itself, we can, as a community, get together and, and figure out why we want open, what we're going to do with that information once we make it open. And my hope is that maybe we can coalesce around something like climate change, for example, uh, or specific subsets of, of the, the to-do tasks in, in climate change, and, and work to, to make things open in, in that particular venue, mm. the data, the research, the educational materials, the policy materials, government yeah. materials, and, and just, just do open, right? Don't, don't say it has to be like this, or don't say it's in this category or in that bucket or whatever, but just collaborate and make things as open as possible in this in this very discrete field and and you know build a snowball and you can show the rest of the research community at that point look at what we did here 
this really works. Look what we've accomplished with it. Look at the practices that have spun out of this. Uh, but more importantly, look what we've done. We've solved pressing real world needs with this collaboration and these ideas. And that, that can grow and spread and create what I would call an open, open renaissance. Uh, we can enter yeah. an age where open becomes the, the de facto way of doing business. It's not because it's an activist position. It's not because, uh, you know, it's some university said that we had to do this through a mandate. It's because it makes sense and because we're achieving things with it and we're solving pressing problems with it. So that's where I hope we end up in five years, Brian, not still arguing over what color of open is best or who's in charge of open, but uh, a researcher centric focus that is solving real world problems with, with our uh, determination. What a vision, an open renaissance and maybe doing this around climate change. Uh, I, I hate to say this, Glenn, but, but we're out of time. Um, no, you have been so generous with us. You you have given us such an, so much insight, so much background, uh, so much detailed analysis. I, I'm I'm really grateful. Um, what's the what's the best way for people to keep up with your work? Is it through the OSI site or go to osiglobal.org? Um, there's a the open solutions paper is published there. I I would love it if if this audience can can take a take a look at it and uh, just email me directly if you have any ideas. Uh, again, we're working directly with UNESCO on this right now. That's the vision that we're hoping to roll out. Uh, the open renaissance approach is central to this. I, I, I would love to get some feedback from your audience on that. Well, great. Um, thank you again. Uh, this has been terrific and good luck. Keep up the great work with OSI and uh, we'll circle back and try and bring you back maybe in a year or two to see how things are going. Okay. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, take care. Have a good afternoon and good luck with the shed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. But don't go, everybody. Uh, let me just let you know what's happening over the next few weeks. And uh, let me just echo our guests. Thanks to you uh, for fantastic questions. Uh, I really, really appreciate them. I, I, I mean, I think our guest was uh, quite right to be in awe of the depth and uh, power of your questions. Looking ahead a bit, we have sessions coming up on STEM and equity, rethinking learning, rethinking the university, eco-media literacy. If you want to see more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about all of these issues, everything from Research One universities, APCs, different colors. In the chat, we just got the most gothic answer, which was the color of bone. Um, just please tweet at us. Use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. And we write about this on my blog, too, so we'll be glad to hear from you. If you'd like to dive back into the past, including our first ever meeting with the OA 2020 leader, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can find them there. Uh, and in the meantime, we are in September, which means that a lot of people are heading into uh, a really unsettled and unnormative uh, semester. I hope all of you take care to stay safe. In some countries like the U.S., Delta is raging like mad. I'm really glad to see all of you. Uh, I hope you all stay healthy and uh, secure, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>